Uh, thank you everyone for staying on for the last talk. Um, so my my topic is already introduced quite a bit by Anna and Augustine, so thank you for that. Um, we're also focusing on tracking neurons across days with high density probes, and we wrote a software called Unit Match to do this. Uh, if you think this title is a bit complicated, uh, we can thank the wonderful world of Twitter or X, uh, because now we also know what this title would be in plain English. We're following tiny brain cells day by day using super detailed tools. So that was very informative. Um, so we're doing spike sorting. Uh, normally, that, that has been introduced by um, Marius already and also by Nick. So what we're doing normally is if we have a bunch of neurons next to a probe and we have a bunch of spikes, we want to know which of these spikes belong to which of these neurons. And we have spike sorting methods to do that. Uh, and as Anna showed before, if we now have chronic recordings, so we have recordings from the same populations of cells, we can stitch those two recordings together and do the same thing, spike sort them together. And now we also know which of these spikes belong to which of these neurons for these two recordings. However, when we end up with many, many recordings, which is now possible, uh, this problem is going to be not scalable anymore. Running spike sorting algorithms on so many data sets together is very cumbersome. And um, I tried it once and I decided I don't want to do that anymore. So instead, we designed uh, a software called Unit Match. And the first part of this talk, I'll explain Unit Match. And in the second part, I'll try to validate uh, how to show you that Unit Match seems to work. So I'm going first through all of the steps of Unit Match. So what it uses as input is the average extracted waveform for every unit for every recording. So what that means is we're going to end up with two average spike waveforms for every unit for every recording. Uh, and we have that for every single recording channel we recorded from. So here you can see an example unit that was recorded on a bunch of recording sites. You can see that the average waveform is slightly different on every recording site. And this is the input that we're using for unit match. So we're extracting a few waveform parameters from this data. And the first thing we're doing is looking where is the maximum uh, maximum uh, amplitude on which channel. Uh, so once we find that, we're going to plot the amplitude as a function of distance from this maximum recording site, uh, which gives you a plot like this. And you can fit an exponential decay function to this. We're now going to find the point where 10% of the maximum amplitude is left, and we call this the D10 distance. And these are all the channels we're including in the next steps of our analysis. So we're only looking at the black recording sites in this case. Uh, we then use these, uh, th this data to compute the weighted average waveform for every unit, from which we can uh, also determine the final amplitude. And because, uh, so this weighted average means uh, it's the waveform weighted by the amplitude on every channel that we included. Um, we can also look at the spatial trajectory. And by that, I mean that Within one single waveform, the um, weighted average position is going to be slightly different at every time point within this waveform. So you can uh, draw a trajectory of the weighted average position over space uh, and over time. And by doing that, you can calculate the travel direction and the travel distance between every two time points within one single waveform. You can also calculate the average position uh, in total of this unit and it will probably sit somewhere close to its maximum recording site. Once we have these parameters extracted for every unit, for every recording, we can compute similarity scores. Uh, this means we are gonna now compare the waveform of this unit we just saw to, for example, its closest neighbor. And we can see that the weighted average waveform is pretty uh, dissimilar between the two. If we look at the two trajectories, we can also see there's clear differences between the trajectory of the unit we just saw as an example and its nearest neighbor. Uh, so we have multiple similarity scores, the decay, waveform, uh, amplitude, centroid uh, volatility. This captures how stable the difference between centroids is over time and uh, the root similarity. So how, uh, how much do these trajectories match? And we can give these scores between zero and one, one being the most similar, and average them to a total score. Now we can do the same thing uh, comparing two waveforms of units from different days. So here again, we have the same example, neuron in black, 
and we have the best match across two days of recording. And we see that both the waveform and the trajectory are ways more similar than the nearest neighbor and within the same day. Also the total scores and all the individual scores seem to be a lot higher. So now for every pair of units that we have, we can calculate this total score. So the way you, you have to read this graph is all the units are here on the x-axis and the y-axis. We first have all the units in day one, uh, first half of the recording and day one, second half of the recording. And this is day two, first half and second half. So the main diagonal here is basically how well can we find a unit itself back from the first to the second half of a recording. You see that the total scores are really high. If we now look at across data, uh, across days data, we can also see a second diagonal appearing, showing that um, across two days, we can actually find very high total scores as well between two pairs of units. We now use this total score uh, to set a threshold for which we say these are putative matches across two days, so putatively the same neuron. So we have this data um, where we know it's the same unit. Those are the ones on the main diagonal. And we have neurons where we know it's the neighbors. These are neurons laying around the same unit. And we can find where the same unit distribution crosses the neighbor distribution, uh, at which we define as the threshold. We can apply this threshold now to the total score distribution of the across day data. And we can thereby find some putative matches. So these are neurons that are probably the same across the two days. First, we're going to run into a problem which has been already described a few times, which is that there might be drifts across recordings, which uh, we need to solve because we don't stitch the recordings. We cannot track the drift across recordings. So we are first going to use this putative set of neurons that we have to uh, find how much drift we have. So we have unit X, which is the same unit as on day one and day two, presumably. And we're gonna look at how far are these two apart and calculate the delta X and delta Y displacement. And we do this for all the putative matches across days we found and take the median and we apply median drift correction to the entire data set. Now we're gonna repeat the first three steps I just show you with these new uh, kind of drift corrected um, data. And we're going to now find, again, a putative set of neurons that are matched across the two days. And from this putative set, we're going to build probability distributions for each of the similarity scores that we have. So here you can see the, the score, one me meaning more similar between two pairs of waveforms. So we see that units above the threshold uh, have high scores on all of these similarity scores, whereas uh, units lower than the threshold have lower scores on all of these. Uh, you might think, why do you want to do this? Well, that's because now we have probability distributions that we can plug into a naive base classifier. And rather than having kind of a broad distribution of total scores, we're going to end up with a cleaner match probability instead. So now you see the posterior match probability of uh, a unit being the same unit within the same day. So we find this diagonal back from units that are actually the same within the same day. And we have uh, higher match probability scores also across two days, lying sort of across the diag a second diagonal. And because this data is sorted on depth on the probe, uh, we can find also the second diagonal back. We can now plot this the same way as we plotted the total scores before. And we can find that, as you expect, the same units, which are the ones on the main diagonal, all have very high probabilities of being the same units, which is great because that's true. And we have neighbors, uh, which have very low probability of being the same match, which is also great because this is also true. And we can also look at the across day data. And here we're going to see a bimodal distribution. Most of the pairs of units across days will not be the same neuron. They will be neighbors. But we see a small part um, with very high probabilities, which are actually matches across days. Uh, we um, were able to track neurons across many days using this uh, toolbox. But how do we know that it's real? How do we know it's not just making up matches across days? Or um, yeah, so we used three different ways of validating a unit match. The first is to use this within recording cross validation. The second is to compare it to other methods. 
And the third is to validate it with functional scores. And Anna already has introduced uh, validation with functional scores, scores such as natural images. So I hope that's gonna be clear. So the first validation is the within recording cross validation. This is a zoom in of this main diagonal. And you're gonna find some um, parts of this main diagonal that are not black, meaning it has a low uh, posterior matching probability. So it's an unexpected non-match because Kilosort thought it was a match and apparently unit match thinks it's not actually the same unit. Uh, we also have unexpected matches uh, with very high probabilities outside of this diagonal. And we can plot this uh, in a graph and uh, you have to pay most attention to the circles here because uh, unit match is made to run on individual uh, recordings kilo, uh, spike sorted, um, which is uh, what we plot in the circles and in the squares we have when we do the same thing, but we use stitched recordings uh, for the spike sorting. And you see that overall unit match is quite conservative. It will more likely miss a unit uh, to be the same than it will say something is there that is not. Um, then we tried validation with comparing to other methods. So this is why we ran it on stitched recordings so that we can apply three different methods to the same data. We can do unit match. We can uh, ask KiloSort whether it thought two units were a match or not across two days. And we can ask expert curators, what do you think, is this a match or not? Uh, first, we're looking at uh, unit match. So this is data from five different mice that is also online and available if you want to try it out. Um, it, this is the number of matches it finds across the two days. Uh, and this is then the overlap with the human curation. And this was blind curation. And you see that uh, overall curators agree quite well with unit match. Now, if we uh, ask the same from KiloSort and we ask how many units or how, what are the matches you found, KiloSort overall finds more matches. However, the overlap with curation seems to be uh, less than with unit match. So uh, yeah, unit match is quite conservative, um, but the matches it found seem valid, at least if you ask expert curators. The last method for validation is using functional scores. Uh, we have a few assumptions that are quite important. So if activity is distinctive across neurons, yet stable across days, then it can be used to validate a tracking algorithm. However, if activity changes over days, one cannot make such an inference because it could mean that we did not correctly track a neuron or it means that we did track a neuron, but the activity changed. So if we find stable yet distinctive functional scores, this must mean that both these things are true. We did track a neuron properly and the tracking algorithm uh, and the functional scores remain stable. So here is again an example neuron, and this time we plot the autocorrelogram, which is the correlation of uh, a neuron spike spiking with itself. Um, and you see uh, the neighbor, or a different unit within the same day again, and you see that the autocorrelogram looks quite different. Whereas if you compare it to a match across two days, it's actually looking very similar. So you can correlate these two uh, autocorrelograms and these two autocorrelograms, and you will not find that this correlates more than this. And you can do that for all of the matches and non-matches you find. And uh, you can see that the same units as well as matches across days have a higher cor uh, autocorrelogram correlation than non-matches or different units within days. You can now ask a uh, receiver operant characteristic curve, um, how, how well can we discriminate matches from non-matches and the same units from different units uh, based on this cross uh, autocorrelogram correlation, uh, which is plotted here. And basically, if you look at the area under the curve, which is a measure of how well you can discriminate uh, these, two function uh, these two distributions, it's quite high. So it's 75% accuracy you can uh, say whether it was a match or not. Now we have different functional scores. So this is the one you just saw. This is the one Anna uh, already presented. So we can look at the responses to natural images. Here we have time courses uh, based on stimulus onset and stimulus offset. And we have the average response to the different uh, sorted images. And again, you see that these are very dissimilar, whereas the match is very similar. A third method of functional scores we found is uh, correlation with a reference population. So this is just cross-correlation with a population that was stable across the two days. And again, we see that the match is way more stable 
uh, or has more similar cross correlation pattern with the reference population than the non matching. So here are the same plots again. This is the one you just saw. And this is for the responses to natural images and the correlation to a reference population. And you see that um, these scores of discriminability are even higher when you use these two uh, responses. The plus side of this cross correlation is that you can apply it to anywhere in the brain. It doesn't need to be a visually responsive area, for example. And all the brain areas we've tested so far, it seems to be really stable. Uh, so this is something you can always use to validate the matches you find. Now we also try to look how long can we do this? Like how, how far away can we track neurons uh, and remain and do the, these functional score remain stable? Uh, this is the same mouse that you've been seeing for the past uh, hour, I think. It's this uh, one of the mice from the Steinmetz paper. And we can see that um, we can track neurons for a very long time. And the autocorrelogram, the responses to natural images, and the cross correlation all remains very stable. And this is now for the different mice uh, that we used in this um, in this paper. We see that overall these scores remain really stable. So we thought think that this validates that the neurons we're finding to to be tracked across days are very are true and stable. Um, yeah. So uh, we used unit match to track neurons across days. Uh, it runs an individually sorted session, so it's scalable, flexible, and quite fast. It gives a probability for a match rather than just a yes/no answer. Uh, it can be used to track neurons in a multitude of brain regions and time scales, and it's fully based on spike waveform and not on neural function, so that you can actually use valid uh, use the neural function the, the functional scores to validate whether your matches are real or not. So you can also ask questions about functional changes, and uh, I didn't show that here, but it's in the paper that uh, came online on Monday we were able to uh, show that individual neurons vary in how they change over learning in the striatum uh, because we didn't use the functional scores uh, to track the neurons. So if you're interested in using this, uh, feel free to try the homework. Uh, it's tagged to the Slack channel, but you can also find it here and the example data you can find on Figshare. Um, that was it for me. <laughs>